Hey guys, Jack Spierko here. Welcome to today's episode of Miyagi Mornings, which I think is 52. I, I, I really don't know. I am, uh, I am scrambling, scrambling, scrambling because uh, the cold front is coming and weather below 10 degrees is expected, which is, for some of y'all, a big deal. Like for us, that's unusual. And so I got a ton of stuff out there that is vulnerable, not when it freezes, but when it freezes multiple consecutive days in a row without going back up above. So I've got to get as prepared as I possibly can. So there may be some shortages of uh, content this week. I'll do what I can to stay on par for you. Today we're going to talk about Bitcoin, crypto in general, but specifically Bitcoin. We're going to talk about what happened with Elon Musk and Tesla, uh, who Mike, Michael Saylor is and who MicroStrategy is and what that all has to do with this and why what looks like an incredible run-up in Bitcoin may just be the very beginning. And before I continue, I do not give investment advice. Um, and I don't know. All I can do is speculate. And that's the truth for everybody, even though not everybody will tell you that. But there are some underpinnings going on in the world of Bitcoin right now. And I know some of you hate cryptocurrency. You hate Bitcoin. And I'll tell you who most of you are. Most of you are people that, have, that are really hateful about this topic. Whenever I bring it up, you're people that have been listening to me to 2014. And what you're angry about is you didn't listen. You didn't get in and you think it's too late. But you know how many times I've heard, I've missed the opportunity, it's too late, over and over and over and over and over again. And I'm here to tell you the facts as we know them right now and why it is very possible that Bitcoin has only just begun to go crazy in price and uh, why it probably has the long-term win behind it. And that does not mean that if you go buy a bunch of Bitcoin tomorrow morning that you might be looking at half the value of it in three weeks. My concern when I talk about this topic, especially to family, friends, close business associates and all, I, I don't know how to put this other than why the fuck do I only hear from you when Bitcoin's at all times high? I've sat for years and years and years during lulls and saying this is a great time to get involved. This is a great time to get involved. This is a great time to get involved. And all my referrals and all my inquiries go through the roof on bull runs and generally right at the top of them. And the problem is, as someone who's seasoned in this world, I have sat and I've watched a portfolio go up $10,000 in a day and $20,000 down the next day, $5,000 up and then, uh, then 25000 down the next. And I've been through it over and over and over and over and over again. Just like everybody else that's long-term held Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. I'm prepared for that. If you're not, don't play this game. Bitcoin is incredibly volatile. That's fine. It's okay. It's supposed to be. And the whole, you know, Bitcoin's going to die. You need to look up Bitcoin obituaries and see how many times Bitcoin has been pronounced dead by people that are now advocates of Bitcoin. So please be careful here with what I'm about to tell you because it's very exciting news overall. So, of course, everybody knows now that Elon Musk and Tesla invested $1.5 billion of Tesla's money into Bitcoin. I talked about this on the show yesterday, so I don't remember the guy's name that tweeted Musk a couple months ago about this, but it's Michael Saylor. He is the CEO of a company called MicroStrategy. He's one of the longest serving CEOs out there right now. Um, he's one of the few that have survived like all the way from the dot-com bust up till now at the same company. Um, he turned to cryptocurrency early. He was one of the first major corporations to put significant amounts of corporate assets into Bitcoin. And he really ramped that up over the summer last year when the government made the, made the, the money printer go burr. You know, the printer goes burr, and they just churned out trillions of dollars. It's like, this is not good for the dollar. This is not good for den dollar denominated interest. And he, so he looked around and said, where's the best place to park money? And he decided it was Bitcoin, more so than gold and silver. And I keep saying this. I always, I, I can't stomach this whole, when they believe in gold and silver, so do I. When they believe in Bitcoin, so do I. Diversity is diversity, guys, all right? And that means that you diversify your assets. Most of you that think you're diversified because your financial advisor, who's really a financial liar, told you that you were, you're holding nothing but stocks and bonds denominated in dollars. That's not diversifying your holdings, okay? Just, I'll leave that at that today. All right, so Michael put his money in there. He tweeted Musk a couple months ago and said, hey, if you want to do your, your, your shareholders a trillion dollar favor, capitalize your cash reserves into Bitcoin. And uh, something like a billion dollars, I think, was the recommendation. And Musk tweeted back and said, 
Are such large transactions even possible? I saw all that go on. And I really didn't know what was going to happen. But I should have known when Peter Schiff came out and said, well, Musk could never be... Schiff is just gold and silver is everything, okay? It's an old world paradigm. Paradigms are dying. I did a whole show on that yesterday. And uh, I should have known when he said Musk wouldn't do it, that Musk was going to do it. Because let me be clear about Schiff. I love Peter Schiff. On a lot of things, he's brilliant. He's also a dinosaur. And he can't mentally comprehend the new paradigm. It's impossible. The people that own the future can. There's a lot of people like that out there. Tremendous respect for him. They can't comprehend the new paradigm. Ed Wallace, you guys probably don't know him. He's a car guy. He invented the first website where he ever could shop for a car online. He was that far ahead. Now he can't understand why electric vehicles are going to rule the world. Can't understand it. Can't understand autonomous vehicles. Just not going to happen. Got too old, too set in his ways. That's where Schiff is. So Saylor does this. A few months later, Tesla comes out and they have to say, we did this. That we did this thing. And uh, because they're a public company. So if they're a private company, they could have bought a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin and never said a word about it. Exactly when they had to disclose this, I'm not sure. But at some point they would have had to. And you're not going to get in trouble for disclosing something you've done as a public company. You are going to get in trouble for concealing it. Almost no matter what it is. Doesn't mean they don't do it. It means that that's how you don't get in trouble. So Tesla comes out with this. But about six days ago, um, Michael Saylor, who is, the, again, the CEO of MicroStrategy, ran a big annual summit. And the entire thing was dedicated to telling companies how to put money into Bitcoin, why to put money into Bitcoin, how to develop accounting practices and cash management strategies, how to do analysis for what portion should go in, how to do it legally, how to stay out of trouble, how to make sure that like your employees weren't using insider trading, like knowing you're about to do this and going out and buying it, like everything soup to nuts across the board. And this was attended by hundreds and hundreds of business executives from all over the country and all over the world, knowing what they were going to hear. Okay. This is where we need to understand the finite limitations of Bitcoin. And my earlier show that I did, or my other episode on Miyagi Morris, I said, what makes Bitcoin valuable? It's status as the reserve currency for crypto. No matter what exchange you use, there's a board where you can buy other cryptos with Bitcoin and you can sell other cryptocurrencies for Bitcoin. Some people call it the the digital gold, okay? Digital gold, because we used to see gold as a reserve for money, which it isn't anymore. But I think that maybe a better way to understand this is the digital reserve currency, i.e. like the American dollar currently is in the world. I was explaining this to my wife today. When I was a young kid in the United States Army serving in Honduras, you could take a $1 bill, wrap it up around a rock, and throw it and watch little kids fight for it. Middle of the jungle in Honduras, a U.S. dollar was incredibly valuable, and you could give them the same amount. So there was an eight lempira to $1 in Honduran money. It was the exchange rate. If you offered them... 10 lempira or $1, they would have took the dollar. That's the reserve status. That's illogical, but it is what it is. That's when people say Bitcoin is digital gold, they're not literally trying to replace a precious metal. What they're saying is it's the reserve currency that all the other cryptos orbit around. This is why if you're in a corporate interest right now and you're going to capitalize into crypto, The bulk of what you're going to do is going to be in Bitcoin, period. And if you do anything that's diversification within crypto, it's not going to be a whole shitload of these altcoins nobody ever heard of, even really good ones. Corporate money, it's going to be something like Bitcoin, Ethereum. And then maybe you even set up a little trading triangle where you ha- you're you using Tether or TrueUSD or something like that to, 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 to capitalize on gains and go back in. Maybe. Maybe. Because most companies that do this, they are not going to go into into trading with it. They're going to take excess cash that they have no place else to put. And they're going to put it there as a hedge against inflation. Because they know the dollar is doomed to... When I say that, stop. Doomed to oblivion, I did not say. Doomed to be devalued. We just printed like three extra trillion dollars. 
and dumped it in the economy. And the only thing that's held back complete insanity with runaway inflation is this. Most of it immediately got taken and spent. That heats up the economy, but it's limited because it got spent with the mega corporations who put it in reserve. Do you see? You starting to connect the dots here? You starting to understand how that works? So when people went out, the, the biggest gain in sales in the country is who? Bezos and Amazon. When Amazon gets that much money, they're not you. They don't want to, let's go party. They, they have a reserve now. They figure out other shit to buy with it or it sits there. And every major corporation has the same issue. And when corporations end up with too much cash on hand, they get in danger of being relisted as something like a mutual fund instead of common stock. This is why, if you want to know why Google originally bought YouTube, they didn't see the vision. They had too much money on hand. They needed to buy something, and it seemed like that's what we'll buy. <laughs> Cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency because your government decided, it is not money. It's a commodity. Okay. Then it's not cash reserves, is it? It's not a, it's not a capital reserve once I invested in Bitcoin as a company, right? So I can keep playing my game over here in the stock market. Now I got a new game over here in the crypto market. I can park the money there. The money is liquid. What I mean by liquid is if I have a billion parked in Bitcoin and I'm like, you know what? We need a million bucks as a bridge loan in this division. I just sell a million bucks worth of Bitcoin that fast. It's liquid. It's the best of both worlds for them. And it hedges against this loss. Now, people say, what if it goes down? It doesn't matter unless you need it. People say, like, how, Jack, how do you handle it when, you know, you're sitting there with a bunch of money in, in crypto and the market tanks for crypto for a, a week here? You've, you've just lost half your money. No, I haven't. I haven't sold anything. It's just sitting there. I only take it when I need it. I don't need it. I don't take it. Many of these corporations don't need it. It's a long hold. They'll take it when they need it and if they need it. They're still going to have a bunch of money in cash over here. They're going to balance the sheets. Now, couple this with this reality. Right now, there's about 18, uh, 18 million Bitcoins in circulation. At least two to three million are lost because when this whole thing started, people mined it, computers are gone, it's unrecoverable. There's probably about 15 million Bitcoins in circulation that you could actually buy. Of that, at least a third, if it went to $100,000, the person with, the, with it in their hand will not sell it. At least a third. That's a guess, but I mean, that's probably a conservative guess. There's people that have been holding this shit without selling it since they bought it for five bucks. They won't let... There are people that will. Don't get me wrong. Up and down is part of this. This is why I get scared when I tell you the truth about this. Because I know people do stupid shit due to FOMO. Fear of missing out. And it's amazing. Again, you can have Bitcoin at three grand. Look, start taking it as a payment and go buy it. And nothing. And then it goes up. And how do I buy it? Don't ask me because I don't want my hands on that. You can figure it out if you want to, right? Go to Coinbase and sign up. But be careful right now. This is an all-time high, but the long-term potential here now. So let's say there were 200 executives at that meeting that either had authority to act on behalf of their company or they're going to be listened to, okay? And let's say 50 of them pull the trigger. What happens to the price of Bitcoin? Understand how much money we're talking about these companies are holding. Competing for this small amount. Because, again, let's, let me get a prop here. Let's say that uh, this, this seltzer can represents all the Bitcoin that's available. Period. It can be bought right now. There's a little bit more that will eventually go up here. It's going to take over 50 years for it to be mined. All right? So... That, that is not even in play. And there's a halving every three years, half of what is being mined. So this tiny piece is the new Bitcoin. You can't make more. The math locked it. It cannot have more. This is not a Federal Reserve note. You can't just turn the printing press on. The printer doesn't go burr. Okay, then you've got a third of it. People will not sell, period. You got a third of it. People are, are willing to sell in extreme circumstances. And a third of what's left is people trading. So what happens when a corporation, let's say somebody as large as General Electric, 
whose market cap is larger than the entire market cap of all cryptocurrency, just one stock. What happens when that corporation decides, hey, let's put 1% of our reserves? The demand cannot be met. I, I cannot emphasize this enough. If this switches to the way it looks like it's going to switch, it cannot happen. You can't do it at anything approaching the current prices. And all of a sudden, these people that sound like lunatics are going, Bitcoin's going to hit a half a million dollars, or Bitcoin's going to hit a million dollars someday. They don't sound like lunatics anymore. They don't sound like lunatics. And this is the key here. This is the key. I'm not going to tell you today. We have one of those rare weeks where I do two episodes in a row where I come back tomorrow and I tell you what the real key is to what's going on here. But when you can't win and you're used to winning, you co-opt. Let that sink around in the brain for a while. I'll come back tomorrow and we'll complete this because I don't want to go too long. 16 minutes is long for Miyagi. We'll catch you later.